Uh, this video covers our May 2021 performance figures for our solar PV, Tesla Powerwall 2 performance here in the UK, along with our Tesla Model 3 and Hyundai Kona electric usage. Plus other things that have happened during the month. So stay tuned. <laughs> Hi, John here and welcome. <laughs> Although I said in my April stats it was more apparent during May, the month really was a mixed month. We had rain, <laughs> biblical rain, we had sunshine, very good sunshine, certainly towards the end of the month, and we had clouds and we had cold as well. And in mid-May, the UK Met Office confirmed that it was wet and cool so far in May, and many areas were nearly at their average rainfall for the month by the 13th of May. And you'll see in a minute, it wasn't a bump a month for us for sunshine compared to our April 2021 generation and our May 2020 total. I'll bring up a graphic on screen which you can pause if you're interested to review all of our components if you're not familiar with our setup and configuration. Also have a look down below in the description there's a full list of components for our system in there as well. As always please comment, like and share as any or all of these actions help get this video shown to more people on YouTube which in turn helps my channel grow. So thank you in advance for those that do that. Your support is greatly appreciated. I'd like to give you a bit of an update on some of the key elements that have happened during the month of May before I get into the stats and the figures. Oh, and I'll be sharing my experience of charging the Tesla Model 3 to 100% at a supercharger, which is actually really interesting. So stick around to the end of the video for that. You may recall if you watch my channel regularly that in April we had our television aerial moved to prevent the birds from doing the droppings onto our solar panels whilst they were perched on the aerial. I can happily report that the relocation position has been a complete success. In May, there were no bird droppings on our panels from perching birds. In May, I also replaced the downlighters in our extension. The reason uh, they were causing drafts. Um, downlighters are really known for leaking heat and causing drafts. We have 12 of them and they were installed in a sloping roof of our single storey extension and this extension was completed back in 2013. And at the time LED GU10 bulbs were in the infancy and there were very limited options available. So it was halogen bulbs were the mainstay for downlighters at that time. So we started with halogen and then we swapped to LEDs a few years later. Our original down lighters were the sort of swivel type, which means you can direct the beam to where you want. And the downside of this is they have a gap around them which allows the bulb mechanism to swivel. Once these down lighters were fitted in the vented roof space, we found that it, when it was very windy and a southerly wind direction, we had what sounded like owls hooting. We worked out over a period of time that it was the wind whistling across the opening of the downlighters and making that sound. A bit like sort of blowing across the top of a milk bottle for those that have done that in the past. Or perhaps still do it today, I don't know. I won't judge. Um, so I stripped out all the old downlighters and have replaced them with um, a sealed 5 watt LED downlighters. Being sealed, they should stop the hooting problem and reduce drafts and heat loss too. We're waiting for some windy weather to test that theory out. So each month with the sort of small upgrades we're doing to the house, it's getting more and more energy efficient in terms of reducing heat loss from the fabric of the building. The more heat you can retain, the less it's going to cost you to heat the building, obviously. Uh, next news is the replacement front door. That's next on the item. Uh, I'm recording this on the 2nd of June and on Friday the 4th of June our new door is being fitted. So I will update you of that once it's installed. <laughs> I now have a yearn to pay for a door blower test and see how much our house actually leaks. 
So if you've had that done, let me know down in the comments below um, because I'd really be interested in your experience um, in terms of the actual results, but also the investigation around finding leaks and what have you. On the 24th of May, uh, Dean Smith, an engineer from AES Metering Services on behalf of Octopus Energy, arrived to deal with our gas meter that had not been commissioned since it was installed on the 30th of November 2020. And after four visits to commission it, it still hadn't joined our network. Dean, bless him, battled rain, uh, a protracted install process and its um, associated software. After spending three hours on site, he managed to commission the gas meter. Both the electric meter and the gas meter are now showing on the in-house display. So perseverance and diligence he had in bucket falls. The installation process, if it fails, it has to be restarted remotely before it can be restarted locally at the address. So Dean had to go through the install process three times to get it to finally go through and commission successfully. Um, <laughs> It doesn't really feel like a very robust process to me. However, all credit to Dean, and I was so impressed I actually contacted Dean's boss to give him a glowing review and positive feedback. Finally, before we get into our May stats, a quick update on the Hyundai Kona EV. In case you don't know, our car is one of the ones that needs to have its battery replaced. As a sorry for the inconvenience, uh, of not being able to charge past the now ma mandated 90% maximum state of charge, Hyundai have offered customers a £30 credit. So far, so good. To obtain this credit, you have to have use of the Hyundai charging app. Um, no problems, I thought, I'll download it. I didn't even know they actually had one. So I downloaded it. I've actually already got a Hyundai account from when I purchased the car online. I tried to log in to the app using my login details and it just took me to a blank screen. The link Hyundai first sent out <laughs> didn't actually work and many users like me got the blank screen. A week later they'd fix this and ask us to all log in again. I went to log in and nope, I need an account. But I have an account, uh, but it's not the right account. So you need to create a new account for two accounts. One for buying and servicing and one for charging. So not ideal, Hyundai. Then there's the question, why do they even have a dedicated charging app for a Hyundai vehicle? Uh, what, you know, what benefit is this to the user with so many sort of existing mainstream apps already out there? I'm thinking sort of ZapMap and a better route planner to name two. You know, perhaps the app was more useful to brand new EV owners who are new to EVs and charging I guess the downside I can see that as a household with perhaps two EVs and unless they are brand loyal to Hyundai they'll have to keep swapping between different apps which is a bit of a nuisance as well as having to have multiple logins and passwords. It's not a great app either um, having had a look at it. £30 credit is only available via their app which as we rarely use public charging with a Kona preferring to charge it at home the credit is fairly worthless to us as a gesture. The £30 is not going to be redeemed by us. Basically, I've deleted the app and my account. Um, so, yeah, there you go. That's the update on that. So let's move on to our solar and battery stats for the month of May, shall we? In our south-southwest facing 6.34 kilowatt arrays, we produce a total of 741 kilowatt hours from our two separate arrays. And we generated an average daily solar generation of 23.9 kilowatt hours for the month. We were 100 kilowatt hours light from April stats total. April was a month I was disappointed with, um, so <laughs> I'm similarly unhappy with May. It's normally a cracking month as well for solar generation. Cooler temperatures and longer sunshine hours gives ideal conditions for record beating generation levels. So it wasn't really until the end of the month that we saw those levels coming in. Do please drop your generation totals and array size down in the comments down below. It provides a great comparison for people and proves very, very popular. Plus, I like to read them and respond to them too. So thank you in advance for doing that. As you can see from this chart, our 4 kilowatt array produced 467 kilowatt hours 
and our new uh, 2.34 kilowatt array produced 274 kilowatt hours. I had hoped May would have been higher. Um, in previous years it always has been. From now on the days get hotter and hotter which reduces the effectiveness of the panels and you rarely get a peak generation um, anymore. So we'll see what June brings in terms of weathers but I'm not holding my hopes out for it. This chart looks at the contribution uh, for self-powered for the month. So during the month I was swapping between cost saving mode and self-powered mode. If the weather looked iffy, um, which it certainly did towards the beginning of the month, we would be in cost saving mode um, to allow us to pull from the grid as needed to get us through the peak 4pm to 7pm period on battery power with the high price of the Agile tariff that we're on. If it was okay weather or better, then I would be in self-powered mode. So 14 days during the month we were in cost saving mode and the remaining 17 days we were in self-powered mode. The weather was very changeable from day to day. We were in self-powered mode from the power and solar contributions for 83% of the time. And as you can see in the stack chart here, that 53% came from the solar generation and 30% came from the power contributions. Based on the month's solar generation figures, I'm sort of fairly happy with that. It's better than I thought it would be in fairness. This is the year-on-year -year chart and it compares the months of May from 2012 to 2021. Values from 2020 onwards are for both arrays, whereas before there, they're just for the single 4 kilowatt array. If you recall, our original 4 kilowatt array produced 467 kilowatt hours, whilst our new array achieved 274 kilowatt hours to make that 741 total you see there. Um, we were down 31% on May 2020 total. This is the Powerwall in and out. We had an 88% round trip efficiency for the month for what we managed to store versus what was able to supply. We stored 287 kilowatt hours and the Powerwall supplied 251 kilowatt hours. Lower solar generation meant that the Powerwall was used more to store energy either from the grid or from excess solar. This chart gives you a little bit more detail on what happened day by day. Solar generation peaked towards the last few days of the month. The highest day was the 30th of May with a total of 41.2 kilowatt hours. Our lowest generation day was 6 kilowatt hours on the 8th of May. We had seven days where we generated under 15 kilowatt hours in a single day. There were 10 days when the house usage, shown in blue, is lower than the solar generation, shown in yellow, which is actually great to see. A large grid pull on the 20, of 26 kilowatt hours on the 22nd of May was due to zero and negative pricing in the early hours of the morning, as it was very windy. Um, other days were just normal grid usage, really, when there was you know, insufficient solar activity. Um, or we ran gas, the glass kiln overnight on cheaper rate electricity. Thankfully, we're now able to run the, the kiln during the day on excess solar. The kilns use about six kilowatt hours, depending on the program they're actually using. So it's nice to be able to do that for free. This chart looks at the four data sources that we've just looked at in a day by day chart. House usage shown in blue is the key one, I guess, to focus on, which is 832.1 kilowatt hours. Export to the grid was 60.3 kilowatt hours over the course of the month, with import being 181 kilowatt hours. We'll look at those figures in a little bit more detail in the next few charts. So this chart is our average daily house usage and our average daily grid usage over the course of the month. Our average daily house usage was down at 28.1 kilowatt hours. That's the blue line. Also down was our average daily pull from the grid at 5.8 kilowatt hours a day from 8.6 kilowatt hours in April. And that's the red line. Hopefully this will drop even more in June and July. But as ever, we shall see. <laughs> this chart looks at what we sent to the grid. We sent 60 kilowatt hours of excess solar generation back to the grid in May, which is better than April, whilst 
um, there is less solar generation to play with, we did make better use of what was generated. So I'm guessing that's the takeaway there. If we scroll down, this is what came from the grid. And it shows that we pulled um, in May 181 kilowatt hours. Again, a reduction over April's total. Onto the eddy, the My Energy eddy. This heats our hot water from surplus solar. Uh, to refresh your memory, at the start of April, I increased the thermostat temperature of our immersion heater in the hot water cylinder from 65 degrees to 70 degrees Celsius. If the hot water needs a boost, basically, because there is no sunshine, then the gas boiler is used. Um, the increase in temperature has meant that we've obviously been able to use more of the solar rather than exporting it to the grid. And as you can see here for the figures for the month, as in previous month, we've done 49 kilowatt hours for the month, which is a lot higher than we had previously been on um, earlier months in the year. We've actually turned off our gas boiler around the middle of the month when it warmed up enough. So hopefully we won't be using that again until the end of the summer or into the autumn. You may have noticed, I've not noted the monthly savings. Um, and the reason for this is that our electric meter has stopped sending data to the DCC and, electric, and Octopus Energy. Its last recorded data was on the 19th of May. And this means that none of the apps could give a, an average unit cost over the month. So I've contacted Octopus Energy to ask them to look into it. And they're actually aware it's an industry-wide problem, specifically for the Kafir MA120 electric meter. Guess which one I have? Yes, the Kafir <laughs> MA120. So um, hopefully that'll all flood back through um, because the meters do hold 13 months worth of data, but uh, it may not give the breakdown um, only the totals for each day. So we'll see, see what happens with that. Keep you posted cars let's talk about those the tesla model 3 covered 464 miles during the month bringing its total mileage to 10,669 miles no issues or problems to report busy month with software updates though we had five software updates over the course of the month and there was also two map updates which aren't shown here as well so a busy month on the software front and as you can see here we've had 41 software updates since we've had the car uh, it's 41 times better than when we picked it up. Oh, I said about supercharging as well. We did one supercharging session where we added a total of 57.9 kilowatt hours. Um, this was at no cost to us for these charging sessions, thanks to those kind individuals who used our Tesla referral code when ordering their cars. So they got a thousand free supercharging miles, as did we. So thank you to those of you who have used our code. Hopefully some more of you may use it as well when you decide to place your order. It would be greatly appreciated. So the one supercharging session we did um, was at Banbury Superchargers. And they were fairly empty whilst we were there. There's 12 superchargers and only three cars charging at the busiest time during our stay. I say during our stay because I decided to charge to 100% and balance the battery pack. Something that I'd not done before. So we hit 100% state of charge at 11.46 a.m. Uh, from then on, the battery management system slowly ramped down the power it was pulling from the supercharger, right down from sort of 14 kilowatts to 11 to 9 to 8 to 7 and so on, right down to from 1 to finally 0. And then we got the charge complete message, which popped up at 12.11 p.m. So which meant that between 11.46 and 12.11, some 25 minutes, the battery management system was balancing the cells in the battery and trickle charging the pack to level it out across all cells. So for those of you with Teslas, make note of the time taken to reach charge complete message if it's something that you're doing when you're going to charge it to 100%. As I said, it's not something I plan to do that very often. And plus, we drove the car straight away once it hit 100%, as it's not good to leave the battery at 100% fully charged for a long period of time. Oh, <laughs> and another thing, absolutely no regenerative braking uh, once you've hit 100%, because there's nowhere for it to go into the battery. 
So uh, be aware of that when you're slowing down. You do need to use the brake pedal for a change. Home charging on the Tesla, we added 81.16 kilowatt hours. And as you can see, 70% of our total charging for the month was from free electricity, that's 82.45 kilowatt hours. Again, I'm unable to calculate the exact cost due to electric meter zoning out and not sending data from the 19th of May onwards. I'll catch up that data um, once it's restored. Oh yes, other things, I had to take the Tesla to a petrol station uh, to fill up one of the jerry cans I've got for uh, topping up the 57 Chevy. Um, a customer actually pointed out while I was filling it up the irony of the situation to me, um, a brand new EV um, filling up an old jerry can with petrol. Um, thankfully the petrol had the desired effect on the Chevy. Um, so those of a squeamish disposition, uh, look away now and cover your ears. <laughs> the sound of a V8. The Kona covered 229 miles in the month and now has a total mileage of 11,819. All charging was done at home where we added just 35.13 kilowatt hours via the My Energy Zappi. And that's it. Um, any questions then dive into the comments down below and I'll pick those up. As I said earlier, please comment, like, share, all of those good actions help us get the video shown to more people on YouTube, which in turn helps my channel grow. Thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next video. Alright, take care. Bye.